Welcome to Realty Talk, the show that brings together the country's most authoritative and respected property experts. Follow us on all the socials and subscribe for updates and exclusive offers. Realty Talk is powered by realty.com.au, connecting buyers, sellers and agents differently. Greetings and welcome to Realty Talk, your property hub's trusted voice for property investment insights, inspiration and stories from Australia's top property experts, leaders and analysts. I'm Bushy Martin from Know How Property Finance, and we've got another smorgasbord of property pickings for you to enjoy this week. Australia is currently enjoying a migration explosion. Property rock star and money magnet author Steve McKnight kicks things off by unpacking what this means for property prices, locations and housing types, and how you can benefit from all of this. And it's that taxing time of year again, and Brad Beer from BMT comes on board to unpack what you need to know and do as a property investor to save money, increase your tax flow, and reduce your taxable income. To help you read the current property tea leaves of conflicting, colliding, and confusing mixed messages, Terry Ryder from Hotspotting sums up where we're at and what you can and need to be doing about things to position yourself best in the ongoing property market. And to close out the show, my partner in crime, Kevin Turner, concludes our special series on the art of negotiation, where he talks to buyer's agent Kate Bakos about the importance of seller motivation. Now, before we get underway, make sure you hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening to or watching the show to ensure that we continue to attract, to attract the industry's best of the best so that you can enjoy leading edge insights from all the industry leaders. And if you'd like a free copy of my award-winning book, Get Invested, make sure you also sign up on the realty.com.au homepage. We've got lots to share, so let's get on with the show. Successful property investment is a game of finance. Do you have the right team and the right game plan? Realty Talk is brought to you by Know How Property. More than mortgage brokers, Bushy Martin and his team of investment architects set you up with a sustainable strategy structured to lower your costs tax, risk and stress while increasing your capacity for growth. KnowHow has helped over 1,900 homeowners and investors secure more than $800 million in property wealth. So get set to live more, work less and live your legacy. Want to know how to invest in your freedom? Visit knowhowproperty.com.au. While the country's in the midst of the tightest rental crisis on record and Australia's new housing pipeline is shrinking, immigration is exploding as the floodgates open to those overseas wanting to share our lucky country as the best place to live on the planet. According to a recent article, the country's experienced an unexpected gain of 191,000 foreign migrants last year, and there's higher forecasts for this year and the next, according to the federal government's key population body, the Centre for Population. This equates, to, this equates to about a thousand new people coming into the country each and every day. So the obvious question, where are they all going to live? And what does this mean for property prices and housing types where, and how can investors benefit from it? To reveal the impacts and the opportunities, we're joined again by highly acclaimed and respected investor and philanthropist, Steve McKnight, who's also the author of his current bestseller, Money Magnet. So welcome back to the show, Steve. It's great to be here, Bushy, and they're all going to live at your house. There's your answer. <laughs> well, they're like sardines here right now anyway, mate, so that's all good. They but can so put gumboots on and go into your shower and <laughs> you can have 100,000 people in your joint. <laughs> There's an image that I don't want to contemplate. But uh, get busy. <laughs> Steve, to set the scene, what effect does immigration have on property prices? Uh, immigration is uh, an issue for real estate because of the obvious people have to live somewhere yeah. now typically when a migrant comes to the country they rent and then when they get into a position where they feel they've got the savings history and the credit worthiness in order to to buy a home uh if if they're obviously coming from money and they're bringing money with them they're coming as a skilled immigrant or under a visa program where they're coming as an investor they can move out and look to buy a home. So short term on rental, medium to longer term on on housing purchases yeah. is the way it normally goes. Yeah. But 
we need people in this country, Bushy. And some people are going, oh, damn it, the roads are busier and the cities aren't, blah, blah, blah. But we need skilled workers in this country because we're, we're not procreating at enough pace to be able to continue to allow those people who are retiring to live the standard of living that they want. We need more younger, skilled people paying more income tax to pay for these crazy infrastructure projects that are being built around the country on debt that's going to have to be repaid. So the problem you've got is not just with real estate, the problem you've got is with infrastructure. If you get a thousand people a day, and it's not just in one area, of course, but a thousand people a day, they're probably going to need a car. The roads are going to get busy. Um, the sewerage systems, because you've got more people, they're only geared to allow for so much. Uh, what, uh, housing, as we've spoken about it, everything just compounds because the, there's more people and governments typically don't plan ahead, they plan behind. And so there's a lag effect. Yeah. And that just means ultimately we're not ready for them. Absolutely spot on. And and we need a lot more to support uh, old buggers like baby boomers like me who are, are about to- You're the problem. Put the pressure on you, mate, to look after me. <laughs> I pay my fair share of taxes. Don't you worry about that. And I'm yet to get a thank you card. I'm waiting for the day. It's I'm coming. Waiting. It's coming. I bet you it's not. <laughs> so if, uh, if we look at the impact then, and you've sort of alluded to this a little bit already, uh, which markets are, are going to be most impacted? Okay, so they're going to go to where the jobs are. And yeah. typically the jobs are in the cities. Uh, now, of course, in the current climate where if you can fog up a mirror, you, you're welcome to get a job somewhere, that situation won't last forever. And there could be a potential pinch coming where you've got all these immigrants at the same time that unemployment starts going up yep. and people can't find jobs. How might that happen? Again, interest rates go up, causing economic decline. Uh, people stop hiring people because their profits are getting marginalised and therefore you've got immigrants coming in looking for jobs at the same time as you've got people being laid off. Double whammy, if you like. So, so long as people are coming in and going to school and they're happy working at McDonald's or grilled or some fast food joint or doing low paid work at minimum wage, no one's really going to care. But these these value add skills uh, for, for university graduates and, and, and for tradies, and, and this is where the skills shortage is, uh, these people will probably be fine. But it's that middle band of people that have everyday skills. If the jobs dry up there, then it, it could it could cause social unrest and ultimately, uh, yeah, um, a bit of difficult times ahead. Yeah, very good read. So let's talk to housing stock then. What, what sort of housing is going to be most impacted, do you think? When it comes to investing, uh, my ex-business partner, Dave Bradley, once gave this really good advice. He said, the best thing you can do is buy a house. But if you can't afford a house, buy a townhouse. And if you can't afford a townhouse, buy a unit detached. And if you can't afford a unit, buy an apartment. And so when people come to the country, they're usually looking for affordable housing, which will put upwards pressure on rents for affordable housing. Yeah. But then they drift off into where they, the, the best place they can afford to live. So I still think for investors, capital cities is the hot point where people come to first, try and get a job, try and assimilate into that part of the capital city where people who look like them and talk like them tend to congregate. Yeah. And they go and try and find a job. And then they away they go on the ladder to house ownership. And I still think that that uh, advice that gave, Dave gave a long, long time ago holds true for where investors should should look to park their money by, as a general strategy, what I say to people till I've, I'm, I'm bald in the head is that I say to them over and over again, buy the best house you can afford uh, in the best area you can afford and just let time and trend be your friend. Now, if that best house happens to be an apartment, so be it. Or if that best dwelling happens to be an apartment, so be it. And if it happens to be in the middle of the range area, so be it. I still think you're better off with a house in a middle range area than a unit in a top range area. 
because ultimately people still aspire to live in houses. So that'll that'll put upwards pressure on prices. But this immigration issue isn't going to be solved by the government saying, that's it, we're going to stop people moving here because we need these people in our economy to fund our standard of living. And we all need to wake up and realise that compared to countries like Malaysia and China, Singapore, our population base remains quite low. So although it seems busy to us because we're used to living on quarter acre blocks of land maybe or we're, we're children of the 60s and the 70s and, and remember the space that used to be here that's no longer here, you go and turn up to any city in Asia and have a look around and then come back to Australia and realise the sky's still blue and the air's still clean and there's more space than what's available elsewhere and that's why people are flocking here in droves. Absolutely right. And uh, following your lead, uh, I purchased some property in the US uh, some years back and spent quite a bit of time over there. And what uh, amazed me really was that we could pack the entire population of Australia into New York City. So uh, just to put some perspective around that, uh, we've got no idea how good we've got it here in that regard. Uh, and, the so and the population into the, the state of Florida, because I was living in Florida at the time and thought, geez, the whole of Australia lives here. It's crazy. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Hey, you, you've touched on this already to some degree, but uh, the obvious question is how, how can investors profit from the knowledge you've just shared with us? Get in the market. There's lots of reasons why you wouldn't invest in fear of loss and interest rates going up and all these reptilian things going through your mind about why you shouldn't do something. But remember this truism. Get your pen out and write it down. Etch it into your head if you have to. So long as people live in houses, you can make money out of real estate. How you make money in real estate may change, but your biggest guide to putting a floor under real estate prices is immigration. More people who come here, the more people have somewhere to live. And if you're in the business of supplying housing, then you should be on the right side of the ledger. 100% agree. Yeah. Look, Steve, as always, I really thank you for opening our eyes to the immigration growth impacts and opportunities. And thanks again for your valuable time on the show today. What a pleasure. Thanks, Bushy. And see you later, everyone. Thank you, Steve. Well, I'm going to misquote you again here, Steve, by uh, saying another paraphrase, which I'm sure I'm going to muck up, but you'll correct me if I've got it wrong, because as long as people need to live in houses, there are property opportunities. And it's fair to say that the current situation is providing plenty of this for proactive players. So if Steve's message has resonated with you and you'd like to hear more from him on this and a host of other property and finance related topics, feel free to enjoy his podcast at moneymagnet.au forward slash podcast. And while you're there, if you haven't done so already, do yourself and your family a big favour and grab yourself a copy of his great new book, Money Magnet, which is also now out on audio. Stay with us for more on your Property Hub's trusted voice for all things property here on Realty Talk. Property deductions can save you thousands of dollars each year. To make sure you maximise deductions, you need to work with the most experienced quantity surveyor in the country. BMT Tax Depreciation is the leading specialist in the industry. They've completed over 700,000 tax deduction schedules for residential investment and commercial properties Australia-wide. BMT guarantee to find double your fee in the first full financial year deductions. Call BMT on 1300 728 726 today for an obligation free quote. For property investors, it's approaching that infamous taxing time of year again when the world always appears to come to a stop on or before the 30th of June. And if you're treating your property investments like a business and you've bought the right type of property in the right type of ownership structure, then tax time is often, often a welcoming time to ensure that you get some of your hard earned dollars back in your pocket. And this is where a good quality quantity surveyor prepared tax depreciation schedule can make a big difference to the cash flow affordability of your portfolio. So to dive into what you need to do and know on this subject, we're joined by show favourite Brad Beer, the CEO of BMT Tax Depreciation, who are Australia's leading provider of tax depreciation schedules. So welcome back to the show, Brad. Bushy, great to be here as always. We're talking tax at tax time again. <laughs> yeah, that's the, what do they say? The uh, only definites in life are death and tax. So uh, it's a great time to be having a chat about this, mate. But uh, what are some of the common tax time mistakes that you see property investors make? Look, I think the, the probably the one of the, well, 
the, the missing out on on claiming deductions that they should, I suppose, is is the one I'd see as a whether it's a mistake or it's, it's the most costly of mistakes, I suppose. And you know, there's there's issues around claiming things that you shouldn't, obviously. And the tax office does run some, and they are again this year running some pretty solid campaigns about making sure that. Uh, and 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 there's some stats on those that they spend a certain amount, they get a fair amount back, and uh, they keep spending more because they get more back than they spend effectively. But making sure that you're not claiming repairs and maintenance for things that should be capitalised, for example, I think is a is a common common situation. Uh, yeah. Incorrect interest interest claims for. Um, for, for when you've topped up loans or you've got, you know, rented to family members and making sure those things are uh, are um, done properly. I think missing out on things like scrapping uh, when you've done renovations, uh, especially, you know, scrapping is when you renovate and you throw some things away, they might have some value left and be instant deductions in that year that you do the renovation. Uh, so yeah. we really need to make sure uh, that, that, you, you get the quantity survey look at it to look at it before you've ripped it apart um, because th that includes and the one we see missed the most is is uh, uh, is, is structural components that are scrapped. You know, you, you you've ripped out a kitchen that's twenty years old. It had half of its life left, so it's an instant deduction for the the, the res residual amount of the cost of that kitchen. So, you know, scrapping. And look, the biggest one is really just making sure you're claiming depreciation, not missing out. Um, so many of the investors that we deal with or I speak to go, I, don't know, I didn't know about that. And, and you can uh, update your last two tax returns pretty easily if you have been missing out. So, you know, but if, you, if you don't pay your tax, the tax office will find you, right? <laughs> uh, and if you don't claim your depreciation, you can kind of go back and find them for a couple of years, adjust your returns and hopefully get some some cash back from uh, from making sure you plan those deductions properly. Yeah. Now, uh, traditionally, uh, uh, a lot of investors believe that an accountant uh, takes care of all this. Is that right? Look, most of the, the work that we do is actually referred by accountants because the accountants, you know, generally do your tax return. There's specialist parts. One of those is what we do as a, as a quantity surveyor is estimate the cost of the construction at the time it was built and marry that up with the tax rules around depreciation to make sure we are compliant, which is why we come there in the first place. Uh, tax uh, accountants don't know about construction costs, uh, quantity surveyors do. Yeah. Uh, and then making sure we claim the claim the things we can. And as many of the things we can, obviously, Bushy, uh, yeah. anything that we can claim faster, we want to claim faster because we like money today instead of next year, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. So we, we, we work alongside the accountant. The, the numbers we do are one of the many numbers that they'll put into a property investor's tax return. Uh, and and it, it'll it'll stack in the in the case of an audit if it's um, uh, done properly and you know inspected, collect all the information to make sure we get it right and get the maximum deductions we can. Yeah, spot on. Now we're we're as I've sort of said at the open, we're about to hit tax time again. So what are some of the things that you see savvy property investors do at this time, mate? Look, firstly, a depreciation schedule ordered pre thirty June means the bill's tax deductible this year instead of next year. Uh, the deductions themselves are applicable to when you've bought the property, so don't worry, you don't you don't miss those out. But uh, look, making sure the records are in order so you can get um, get everything to the accountant, and they they're not going to miss things if it's presented easily. Uh, that, in, as we say, depreciation is a big piece of that. Um, it includes the depreciation schedule, but everything you know, making sure that you've taken uh, taken all the receipts and, and listed them out somewhere. Um, the things that you've spent. When you spend money, you usually get deductions in investment properties, um, making sure you've got uh, all those expenses together easy so they don't get missed. Yeah, absolutely spot on. Rather than uh, uh, throw them into a shoebox and then chuck them at the uh, on the accountant's desk once a year and then hope for the best. Uh, yeah, I, think the, uh... <laughs> I think the shoebox has changed to a, a big bunch of PDFs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, exactly right. It's exactly right. No, good, good call. I'm showing my age now, Brad. But mate, uh, as always, I uh, want to really thank you for these very timely reminders, and thanks again for both your generous time on the show and your ongoing support. Well, she always a pleasure. Love tax time. <laughs> thanks, Brad. Well, as you've just heard, 
Uh, if you're a property investor who's looking to reduce your taxable income, increase your cash returns and save money at tax time, you need to ensure you've had a high quality quantity surveyor prepared tax appreciation schedule done on your properties. And there's no one better than BMT to do this for you as they find their clients on an average about just under 10 grand a year in the first full financial year of your deductions. So get in touch with Brad and the BMT team at bmtqs.com.au. So with us for more on your property hubs, go to place for all things property here on Realty Talk. Successful property investment is a game of finance. Do you have the right team and the right game plan? Realty Talk is brought to you by Know How Property. More than mortgage brokers, Bushy Martin and his team of investment architects set you up with a sustainable strategy structured to lower your costs, tax, risk and stress while increasing your capacity for growth. Know How has helped over 1,900 homeowners and investors secure more than $800 million in property wealth. So get set to live more, work less, and live your legacy. Want to know how to invest in your freedom? Visit knowhowproperty.com.au. Now, given the continuously changing dynamics in property conditions across the country, along with a plethora of varying and often conflicting views and opinions, it's often difficult to decipher what's really going on so that you can actually make better property decisions. To add confusion to the uncertainty, we're currently peppered with stories about rising rates, falling property values, builders going bust, rental crises, mass migration, and imminent threats of the big R word of recession. So how do you read the current property condition tea leaves of conflicting, colliding, and often confusing mixed messages to sum up where we're at and what you can and need to be doing about it? Well, there's no better person to cut through the confusion to give you both clarity and comfort based on hard data than the David Attenborough of property, Terry Ryder, who's a property writer, author, and 35-year property research veteran, and the founder of highly respected hotspotting.com.au. So welcome back to Realty Talk, Terry. Thank you, Bushy. Um, I'm not yet the David Attenborough. I'm, I'm hoping to be. He's 96, um, and I'm way short of that. In the making, mate. In the making. So yeah, well, um, I mean, he, he just never retires because he loves what he does, and I'm hoping to do the same thing. I hope 30 years from now I'm still going to be sitting here right here with you, about, mate. Um, about uh, residential property across Australia. Mate, I might be sitting in a wheelchair and having a pacemaker, but I'll be right beside you there, Terry. So, um, mate, uh, look, uh, I really want to jump into the subject. So to, to sort of sum up currently property addictions, how would you describe it in a word and why are you going to choose that word? Well, the word for me is shortage. It's all about shortage. I think 2023 is an incredible year of opportunity for investors. And it's because of shortage, shortage of properties available for rent, shortage of properties available to buy. You know, there's a shortage of listings in most parts of Australia, as well as a shortage of properties to rent. And um, this means that um, you can buy, you know, let's face it, markets aren't as competitive as they were. Even the markets have held up well. Um, there are some exceptions, of course. Uh, Perth would be one of those and maybe Adelaide. Yeah. But there are many markets across the country where you, you can probably buy better than before. Um, but um, the, the big thing is the, um, the incredible shortage of rental properties and what that means for property investors. Um, I've never seen so many places with vacancies so low as we currently have. And I've been doing this for a while. It's actually over 40 years now that I've been researching and writing about real estate. And we've never had vacancy rates like this in so many places. And that means that we're seeing incredible growth in rentals. One of the exercises I was doing um, over Easter weekend when I was supposed to be relaxing, I was updating a spreadsheet um, which had um, locations based on you know, high rentals, uh, high rental yields. And in many of these places, prices have actually increased quite a bit since I last updated it six months ago. But despite price increases, rental yields had risen, which means you know rents are rising faster than prices, even in those locations where prices continue to rise at healthy rates. And that means that I think what I, what I often say to people, when you're thinking about buying a property, don't just consider the rental yield you can get today. Think about what it will be in two years' time. Because if you get, say, a modest... 10% rental increase for the next two years each, 
a rental yield that might start out at five and a half percent could end up at seven percent plus in a couple of years' time. Yeah. And then you've got a positive cash flow property. Absolutely, which is uh, very rare and and that scarcity, uh, uh, given that shortage is a, a pretty good indicator of things to come. Uh, because uh, we all all know we've got a supply shortage in relation to the housing provision front as well, which uh, hopefully will uh, encourage uh, that side of the equation. But uh, sort of flipping back to the the media's view of life, what's your read on the the current metric of the moment that they're all quoting in relation to interest rates and the national rental crisis? Yeah, uh, yeah. Simplistic and simplistic analysis and misinformation is pretty much what we get from mainstream media. Um, I often say to people, look, if you want to be well informed about real estate, you've got to stop reading newspapers and tuning into mainstream media. Tune out all that white noise and do some real research. Get some proper information because um, there's almost zero real analysis in media about what's going on in real estate. Simplistic view, I mean, they go to the wrong people for information. They go to economists and they're not real estate specialists. Most of them don't get it. They think that the only metric that matters is what's going on with interest rates. That fails to explain a lot of things, including why we've had markets where continue to be strong in a period of when we've had 10 consecutive interest rate rises. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and, and the other thing that I think it hasn't been brought out in media, which I think is really important to understand, is that those markets which have dropped, like uh, Sydney and Brisbane, where we're seeing prices fall away there, um, they were actually falling before interest rates started to rise. Yeah. And we know that as we chart sales activity. Um, Brisbane and, and Sydney both had big drops off in activity in the first quarter of 2022. That was long before the first interest rate rise in May 20, 2022. Yep. So those markets were in decline, and the same was true of the Sunshine Coast, the Gold Coast, uh, Byron Bay, those markets, those iconic sea change markets, which had been doing so spectacularly with price growth. They were all past their peak and were falling away before interest rates rose. And equally, we've seen markets, we started to see prices rising in the early months of 2023, and that predates the interest rate pause. So right in amongst all this um consecutive interest rate rises. We're actually seeing many markets doing really well, an increasing number of markets now producing price growth according to all the data sources. Um, so it doesn't really um, correlate with what media is telling us or what economists are telling us. 100% agree. Let, let, let's turn on now town to the, turn to the national rental crisis, which again, I don't know about you, Terry, but uh, I've seen this coming for a long time uh, mm. given uh, the, the sort of hands-off approach that governments have taken and the finger-pointing approach they take to blame someone else for the, the condition. Uh, what's your read on on the rental crisis and uh, any thoughts you have in relation to how and if it uh, might be able to be soothed? Well, it's the most serious that I've ever seen. As I said earlier, I've more than 40 years of doing this, um, analysing real estate markets. I've never seen vacancies so low in so many places rents rising strongly. The politicians have caused it. Uh, they haven't got a clue. They don't understand how they caused it. They don't understand how we got into this shortage crisis and therefore they don't have a clue how to fix it. And they're talking about, in some cases, rental caps and, um, you know, restrictions on Airbnb and, um, you know, we're going to build a million more dwellings according to the federal government starting next year, which doesn't help anyone looking for a rental property this year, of course. No. But it's, it's simply that over the last five or six years, um, federal and state governments and some of the bureaucracies like APRA have, you know, implemented a series of decisions which have discouraged property investors. Yeah. A third of Australian households rent and 95% of the, the properties they rent are provided by ordinary investors. You, me, um, the bloke down the road is an electrician and bought, he owns one rental property, which is what most investors are like. They, they're on ordinary incomes and they own one, maybe two properties. Yeah. Not rich, greedy people rip, ripping off the system, which is what media likes to tell us and some of the politicians like to portray it that way as well. So these ordinary Australians who are the source of 95% of the, the homes that people rent, a third of households, have been massively discouraged by a range of decisions over the past five or six years. So more and more dropped out. So now we have a shortage. 
media has belatedly picked up on it and being media, they're portraying it in a very shallow way. And now we're seeing stories about, you know, bastard landlords and, um, you know, how maltreated tenants are. And, you know, there's a certain amount of truth in some of those stories, but it's not the mainstream. The mainstream is that the people who are being um, vilified are actually the people we need to be encouraged. They're the solution, not the problem. Yep. But the polys don't get that, so there's no solution in sight. It's going to get worse before it gets better from the tenant's viewpoint. Well, everyone's viewpoint, I, I think, to be perfectly honest, because uh, as you well say, investors have been driven out of the market, not only by rising costs, but uh, all of the uh, the changes in tenancy laws, which very clearly favour the tenants and make it very difficult for a landlord to control his own property. Uh, and, you know, the ongoing assault uh, that keeps getting levelled at them, uh, it almost feels like the government's cutting off its nose to spite its face, to be perfectly honest, because, as, as you say, the, the real uh, solution to this problem is to actually incentivise, embrace and encourage uh, investors to see them as friends, not foes. Uh, but uh, un unfortunately, uh, I'm not not seeing governments or anyone else like to to understand or get behind that uh, message anytime soon. What's your thoughts? Well, politicians don't really solve problems, or they don't even want to solve problems. What they want to do is to be seen to be doing something. And one of the things they always do when there's a major issue they haven't got a clue about is to um, scapegoat an unpopular minority. It's yes minister stuff. You know, any, anybody who is a fan of the iconic British comedy Yes Minister, there was actually an episode in which they discussed what you do as a government if you want to be seen to be doing something but not actually changing anything. And that is you have an inquiry, and after the inquiry you have a Royal Commission, and at the end of that you scapegoat an unpopular minority and blame them for the problem. Australia did that some years ago on the issue of affordability. They scapegoated foreign investors, and that was a great opportunity to slug them with new taxes and get all you know, more revenue out of the property industry, but it didn't improve housing affordability one iota because foreign investors were never the problem. So now with the, the problem of the rental shortage crisis, uh, some politicians and some media are scapegoating property investors, but in reality, they're the solution, not the problem. And we've got um, the Greens, for example, suggesting rental caps and wiping out negative gearing and um, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with the situation in Ireland, um, Bushy, but in Ireland they did there everything that the Greens would like Australia to do. They eliminated um, tax benefits for investors. They increased property taxes. They had rental caps, all sorts of detriment, everything that was detrimental to landlords. They've ended up with a rental catastrophe far worse than you have in Australia. So that's what Australia's headed for if we implement some of the policies that are being suggested by uh, the state government in Queensland and by the Greens nationwide. Um, it would be a disaster. 100% agree. And now, um, uh, I know we've, we've talked about the opportunities in the current market on a, on a previous episode. Uh, so today, I just want to sort of conclude on you know, what are the risks out there that investors need to be aware of and, and what, if anything, do they need to be doing about them? Yeah, I think... The risks are really with their own behaviour. I mean, they're, you know, I th as I said, I think that 2023 is a year of opportunity because we have this shortage yep. of everything. And there's opportunities for people to, to buy quite well in areas that have got credentials for future growth and have really strong rentals and rising yields. Um, but the, the problem with most investors is they want to do everything on the cheap. They're not willing to invest in good advice. They're not willing to invest in good information and it's the worst kind of false economy. So that's where the dangers lie. Um, being influenced by media rather than doing real research or being willing to pay for some good information. Um, and so they end up with a bad result. That's that's the risk because otherwise what I see is opportunity. Yeah, no, extremely well said as always. So uh, Terry, I want to thank you for your very fact-based and balanced observations again. And thanks for your valuable time on the show today. You're most welcome, Bushy. Thanks, Terry. Well, it's clearer than ever that based on the cold hard facts, national property conditions are dominated by shortages. And shortage is another word for scarcity, which is code for opportunity. So if you want to take advantage of the current property landscape, you need to verse yourself with the best available current property reports and information for areas across the country, which you can access from Terry and his team at hotspotting.com.au. 
keep listening to Australia's longest running and most popular property show on your Property Hub's go-to place for all things property here on Realty Talk. Kate Bacos is an outstanding buyer's agent. She has a wealth of knowledge and experience when it comes to helping families secure their dream home or the perfect property to add to your portfolio. In the final in our series, we're going to ask Kate to talk to us about the importance of seller motivation and if it's really polite to ask. Kate joins me in just a moment. Property depreciation is the natural wear and tear of a building and its assets. Property investors can claim depreciation as a tax deduction each financial year. Depreciation is a non-cash deduction. This means you don't need to spend any money in order to claim it. On average, BMT tax depreciation find residential investors almost $9,000 in first full financial year deductions. Call BMT on 1300 728 726 today for an obligation free quote. Have you ever been tempted to wonder what the motive? You see a sale sign, right? Oh, sorry, a for sale sign. And you wonder what the motivation is behind the sale. Why are they selling it? Are they unhappy with the house? They don't like the area? How important are these questions? Kate Bacos, who's a buyer's agent, she's joined us for this entire series. It's been phenomenal too. Kate, in some ways, I'm sorry to say this is our last episode, but no. a very important question, Kate. How important is this, the seller's motivation? Well, it's only important if you're interested in the property. If you're not interested in the property. Oh, that's all. I like that. Yeah. If you're yeah, there to but, have a sticky But thing. I'm curious. You know, I drive down the street and I want to know yeah. why someone's selling. Right. But do you want to know why someone's selling because you live near that street and it might impact your property value? Or do you want to know because you're potentially interested in buying the property? Yeah. Well, two things, I guess. And, and the most yeah. relevant one is that you want to buy the property so therefore it is yeah. very important but tell it us is. why and how do you are have we got the right to even ask that question yeah of course we have this is why we have selling agents they're a conduit and while you don't want to go offending them and you have have to always remember that they might be friends with the vendor. It could be a family member. But mm. typically, the agent's the independent third party that, well, they're not independent, they're working for the vendor, but they can be a conduit. They won't necessarily take bad feedback straight from a buyer and just deliver it straight to a vendor. They, they need to wrap the vendor in cotton wool when they're giving bad feedback. But it is okay to ask, especially if you've got interest in the property or if you've got a personal reason for wanting to know. You mm -hmm. might be a neighbour or your property might be impacted by the same thing that you think is impacting this one. But when it's not okay to ask is when you're doing it all the time and you're not interested in the property or when you're doing it loudly at the door during an open and you're making the agent's job hard or you're, you're giving the agent such a difficult time that other buyers are, are noticing that you might be being a menace. So. Being a menace and being naturally inquisitive are two different things. And there are ways to ask as well. We can chat about that. But, but Kate, let me ask you this. If there is a reason that they're selling because they've got a bad neighbour mm. or something's bad with the property, it's full of white ant or whatever, yeah. it, really, practically, is the agent going to tell me that? Look, there are things that agents do need to disclose. You can't hide everything. If it's a, a neighbour dispute, that's that's one issue. But if it's full of white ants or mm. you know, if, if there's been something horrendous that happened at the property, uh, agents have a duty of care that they have to disclose. And we've got rules in states and territories around what has to be disclosed. Mm. Yeah. So if, they can't if escape it, that. If it's a major defect like that, but some, something like a divorce, that's private. That doesn't have it to be It is private. Yeah. Now I, do, I don't need to know people's dirty laundry, but if I'm interested in a property, what I'd love to know is what, what can I understand about the vendor's needs that, that I could potentially mm. Um, mm. put into my offer that like we said in the last couple of segments we did, how do you swap? in an offer that might not be the highest. Well, if you've found out a bit more about the vendor, they might be building a house uh, and they're getting close to completion and they need the money for another drawdown payment. Well, you might offer them an opportunity to stay as tenants in the house while they're waiting for their, their property to get to lock up and to get mm. to occupancy. There's all kinds of reasons for asking what's going on, but the, the real question is, are we dealing with a motivated vendor? I ask agents that often, especially when I get word of off markets and I go and see the property and I think mm, that price tag doesn't sound right to me. It sounds quite inflated. I need to know, is the vendor genuinely motivated or is this just an opportunistic sale? Because that will help me sort out whether it's a property I want to shortlist or not. 
Yeah, sometimes it's not a matter of what you ask, it's how you ask it. And I think if you couch it in terms of, you know, if I, if you were an agent and I wanted to find out from you, I could say, well, look, I, I am interested in the property. I'd just like to know what the motivation of the seller is in case I can couch my offer to suit their needs. Are you mm. able to tell me why they're moving? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. do it that way. You're explaining why you need to know. And I'm not just yeah. a sticky beak. That's right. And it also is quite relevant in our auction capitals, auction cities, when buyers are asking if they can make a pre-auction offer. Mm. Why don't we try and find out whether the vendor is interested in a pre-auction offer first? Because you get some situations where a vendor is very nervous about auction or they don't want to wait for that long. They'd love to have it sold quicker. They might have a, a date that they're working to. They could just be absolutely petrified about auction day they're great vendors to to get a pre-auction offering too because they're not expecting you to give them a price that is so exorbitant you know they're tempted to stop the auction so finding out the motivation also to continue the campaign or the time frame versus a quicker sale they're okay questions to ask and the same goes for understanding settlement dates if if you know that the vendor is really keen to get the property sold first and then go shopping for their next home they might want a 120 or a 150 day settlement. If they've purchased something or they're moving, well, they may, they might love 30 or 45. Wonderful stuff, Kate Bakos. It's been a great series. Thank you so much. I might just make an invitation now to, if you watch this series and you've got a question that we haven't answered for you and you'd like to ask Kate, let me know. Just send me an email, kevin at realtytalk.com.au and we'll certainly pass it on to Kate. And we'll uh, we'll send you a special episode of the series. Kate, it's been delightful talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. I always enjoy my time oh, with you. Me too, Kevin. That's and good luck to our listeners. Yeah, indeed. And uh, Kate, thanks very much for your time. If you want to, if you want to get the best advice, if you're buying a property, make sure you contact Kate Bakos. Kate Bakos is a buyer's agent out of Melbourne, and uh, she's available. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Thanks for your time. See you next time, Kevin. And that brings us to the end of this week's show. Another big thanks to our guests, Steve McKnight, Brad Beer, Terry Ryder, and Kate Bakos. And before we go, make sure you don't miss another episode of your trusted voice for all things property by subscribing to the Property Hub on your favourite pop- pop- can't even say it, your favourite podcast player now, where you'll also enjoy the Get Invested podcast delivered to you each and every week. Thanks again to realty.com.au, BMT Tax Depreciation, Apero Marketing, DM Media and Southern Cross Stereo for their ongoing support. I'm Bushy Martin from Know How Property Finance and along with Kevin Turner and the entire Property Hub Realty Talk team, please remember that if you don't go after what you want, you'll never have it. If you don't ask, the answer will always be no. And if you don't step forward, you'll always be in the same place. That's food for thought and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Miss something in this week's show or want to catch up on past shows? Do it anytime at realty.com.au where we connect buyers, sellers and agents differently. 